Last week, you met a friend of mine, Tim Newbrander, from college days. And in college, Tim and I both knew Jamie. Uh, he stayed in touch with Jamie. I haven't. But Jamie was a German major. And he rented a room in a house of the German professor. And he invited us over to her house one evening, several of us, maybe a half a dozen or eight. And we enjoyed dessert and coffee together. Then we went into the living room where there was a grand piano. And Jamie sat down and treated us to a virtuoso recital. Now I was surprised because uh, our college had a conservatory of music and someone with uh, such a gift was not in the conservatory of music, he was a German major. In this school there was a 2,000 seat auditorium and I can remember one time Jamie playing. And when he finished, again this is where there are pianists in a school of music, when he finished playing, there was an immediate standing ovation. Such was his giftedness. And we were treated to a private living room recital. The passage we come to today has those kind of elements. Something that is virtuoso and that is witnessed by just a couple and then the rest of us are let in on. Let's pray. Lord, as our souls were hushed by Jamie's playing, we pray this day that our souls would be hushed and enveloped by, in wonder by who you are. Be with us in the reading, preaching, hearing, and acting upon your word. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 9, verse 28 through 36. Now about eight days after these sayings, Jesus took with him Peter and John and James and went up to the mountain, up on the mountain to pray. And while he was praying, the appearance of his face changed and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly they saw two men, Moses and Elijah, talking to him. They appeared in glory and were speaking of his departure which was about to be accomplished at Jerusalem. Now Peter and his companions were weighed down with sleep, but since they had stayed awake they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. Just as they were leaving him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three dwellings, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were terrified as they entered the cloud. And then from the cloud came a voice that said, This is my son, my chosen. Listen to him. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. And they kept silent, and in those days told no one any of the things they had seen. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and truth. And from his fullness have we all received <coughs> grace upon grace. Hallelujah. Amen. Well, can you imagine waking up, you're a high school student, let's say, taking a physics class, and there in your bedroom is your physics teacher, along with Sir Isaac Newton and Albert Einstein. They kind of make you rub your eyes once or twice. Or, or let's say you just came groggy to church, and uh, you were in the choir, and you stumbled into the choir room, and there was Charlene, flanked by Bach and Beethoven. You would think she is keeping some pretty good company. Who knew that she knew Bach and Beethoven? There they are, the three of them just talking away. And you might be a little more impressed if you thought for yourself for a second, these guys are dead. And here they are in our choir room talking to our very much alive Charlene. Well, this is the experience that Peter, James, and John have. 
They awake to see Jesus flanked by Moses and Elijah. These are the premier figures of the Hebrew faith. Moses being the lawgiver and Elijah bring, being the seminal prophet. We often refer to the Hebrew Bible as the law and the prophets. And there we have the law in Moses and the prophets in Elijah. These two share in common that their death is not recorded. They are transmitted to heaven. And the two of them both ask to see the glory of God. And in the cleft of the rock, he lets them see the backside of his glory. Now, Peter is the one who says something first upon seeing this. And it was Peter who had said the very last thing that we would have read prior to the passage today. And that's known as the confession of Peter, where Jesus asked, well, who do people say that I am? And it's Peter who says, you are the Christ. The most elevated statement about Christ so far in his ministry. <coughs> Well, as lofty as that confession was, we come now to this passage we just read to find that his understanding must be elevated even higher. We have had Peter's confession. Now we have the Father's profession about who Jesus is. In it we see who Jesus is, <laughs> why he came, and what we must do. Who Jesus is, why he came, and what we must do. Who? Well, you know, if you read a book like uh, Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath or Faulkner's Absalom, Absalom, uh, you need a little bit of background about the Bible to understand the author's message. And so is the case here. To understand this passage, we have to have a background in Exodus. And that second book of the Bible, that title, the word Exodus is actually used in our passage, but it's translated so we didn't pick up on it. It's the word departure. Ex as in exit, adas as in odometer, the way out, the departure. And uh, so we're to be thinking of the Exodus backdrop. And in Exodus, there's a mountain, there's luminescence, there's a cloud, and there's a voice. And here we have a mountain, a luminescence, a cloud, and a voice. And what we're supposed to be thinking is there is another Sinai experience, that place where God specially engaged the human race is happening all over again. Now in that story of the Hebrews coming out of Egypt, part of it is that there was a cloud by day and a pillar by night. And it's the glory cloud of God that does two things. It gives shade and rest by day and light and warmth by night. And it's this glory cloud that envelops the army of Pharaoh and causes confusion and their defeat. It is the glory cloud that envelops Sinai where Moses is given the Ten Commandments. And it is the glory cloud that comes down upon the tabernacle when the Lord is present. The glory cloud is a physical symbol of the spiritual presence of God. It is a physical symbol of the spiritual presence of of God. Now when that glory cloud came down on the tabernacle, we read in Exodus and in 2 Corinthians also that Moses became lighted up. And what we have with Moses is something very different than we have here with Jesus. For Moses, it was a reflection like the moon reflects the sun. But here we have not the glory cloud coming down to Moses, we have the glory cloud coming out of Jesus. The glory descends to Moses, 
but it comes from Jesus. He is the glory cloud himself. And that's why the writer of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 3, says that Jesus is the radiance and the exact impression of God's being. Now that impression is like if you put your hand in the sand, that impress, if you have an invisible God who is light and light, and you made an impress of it, you would have Jesus the Christ. He is the radiance of God's very being. Now, it is in this situation that Peter says, let's build three halls of fame for you famous guys. Right after that, God says, this is my son. In other words, Peter, you see three famous guys, but I give you one unique son. Uh, you see three prophets that wanted to be close to God. I show you the one that all the prophets wanted to be close to. You see three who are enlightened prophets. I show you the one who lit and lights all the prophets. You're trying to be close to the prophets and they're trying to be close to God. I show you the one that all the prophets have tried to be close to. You want to bring people to a place, I bring someone to you. In other words, Peter, everybody, you and me, Jesus is the glory of God manifest for our eyes. There was an old movie with George Burns called, Oh God. Maybe you remember seeing it, and at some point uh, there's this conversation. He says, Jesus Christ? Yeah, he's one of my boys. Just like Muhammad and Buddha and Confucius. Uh, nothing particularly special, but just one of my special guys. Well, uh, that has a sort of an air of sophisticated tolerance, but it belies not reading the Bible and understanding this proposition from the Bible that Jesus is the radiance of God's being. And here we see it. In fact, in the Orthodox Church, there are three major holidays. Of course, the biggest ones are Christmas and Easter. And you'd ask, well, what would rival the virgin birth and the empty tomb? It is the transfiguration, this showing forth of Jesus as the radiance of God's being. Who is Jesus? He is the radiance of God's being. Now what did he come to do? Or why did he come? Well, I didn't have anything to do with my coming. I, I, you know, I just didn't engineer it. I just showed up. And I've been working on a mission statement for my life ever since. But that is not the case with Jesus. He came into human history by his express design to do one thing. And if we're to find out what that one thing is, we have to go back again to Exodus, where we find that the departure to the promised land was affected by a death. It was made possible by a death. When the holiness of God wreaked holy havoc on sin, it exacted the price of death. And so a firstborn died when the angel of the Lord moved over the camp, or a lamb died where the blood was put on the threshold of the house. In other words, the departure required a death. And isn't it interesting that departure and death go together in our euphemisms? We say the dearly departed. The dearly departed. The recently departed. Now, this mountain is enveloped by the glory cloud. And when we read this story in Matthew and Mark, it tells us explicitly that the disciples were terrified. Not a little bit nervous, they were terrified. Why were they terrified? Because wherever the glory cloud was, heretofore, death followed. And so when the glory cloud was on Sinai, if your foot transgressed the boundary of even the foothills, you died. And so here they are, caught up in the glory cloud of God, and they are thinking, we are dead. 
we are dead. For no one can see God and live. So our question is, well, why are they still alive? And the answer is, they saw God and lived because he saw them and died. Uh, Moses and Elijah went up to heaven because Jesus came down from heaven. Uh, Moses and Elijah, Peter, James, and John are together because Jesus became alone. Jesus died the death that you and I should die. So why did Jesus come? Jesus came to die for you and for me. And we remember that in this table forevermore, that he came into history at his design for an express purpose that we might see him and not die, and he would die the death you and I deserve. Now, this passage also tells us what we must do. It, it says two things it suggests to us, and one thing we must do. The two things it suggests, first, that we ask God to reveal himself to us. Remember when Jesus said, you are the Christ, Jesus replied, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. So ask that God would reveal to you that Jesus is the Christ and that Jesus is the radiance of God's very being. Now, the disciples didn't get shown the radiance of God's very being because they were awake. They were awakened by the radiance of God's very being. They didn't apprehend the knowledge of this because they were so bright. Because the brightness shone on them, they were able to apprehend it. So you and I, let's pray for the illumination of our souls by God himself. The second thing is, if he came to live the life we should live and to die the death we should die, let him. It was a project that he put all of himself into. Don't deny him what he says is necessary and what he sacrificed so much to do. Exchange places with Jesus. Let him live in you. Let him die for you. That's what he came for. There's only one imperative or one command, and this is the one thing we must do. The voice says, listen to him. Listen to him. So of all the voices and all the noise and all the people in the world, listen to Jesus. Observe him. Study him. Consider him. But listen, listen Listen to Jesus. The word of the Lord, we pray. Hallelujah. Lord, we thank you that you came in such effervescence and glory. Uh, we know in our own day and age about radiance and radiation a radioactive cloud, but we have lost the respect and fear that we have about those things for the holy. And so without the mystery of faith, we don't have the wonder of worship. But we pray that you would come and shine upon us in such a way that we realize that you're not just another bright guy, but you are the essence of God, come to love us and show us the way. Be with us and help us, we pray, in Jesus' name, amen.